Welcome to another installment of our panels as podcasts from Con of Thrones. This one is a panel that Elizabeth did at Journey's End, Theon Greyjoy, and she was on her panel with, I'm going to put links for it to everyone in the show notes, uh, Kyle Foster, who is Azor Hype on Twitter, Michael Monaco, who is at Bookshelf Stud on Twitter, Matthew Murdick, and also uh, <laughs> the queen of fans of Theon herself, Petra Halber, who has been on our podcast when we talked about season eight generally and is one of our favorite people. Already enjoy the panel and check out everyone's links in the show notes. It's always seemed like this. Like there was an impossible choice I had to make. Stark or Greyjoy. Our father was more of a father to you than yours ever was. He was. And you betrayed him. Betrayed his memory. I did. But you never lost him. He's a part of you. Just like he's a part of me. The things I've done. It's not my place to forgive you for all of it. But what I can forgive, I do. You don't need to choose. You're a great joy. And you're a star. My name is Matt Murdick. I founded Podcast Winterfell in 2012, and I mainly talk about the music in Game of Thrones. Uh, you can check out all of those podcasts. And I am really pleased. Petra is, Petra, Petra is going to be on the uh, panel with me on Sunday talking about the music of Game of Thrones. That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, Theon is one of my very favorite characters, and I'll just leave it at that because I'm sure we'll get better definitions. <laughs> I'm Kyle. Uh, I run the YouTube channel named Azora Hype. And uh, yeah, I just really love Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones and pretty much anything nerd. And happy to be here and chatting about Dion Greyjoy, who has one of the, the best journeys as far as characters go in Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire. Sure. My name is Michael, also known as Bookshelf Stud. Um, I'm a moderator on the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit, also a host of the Maester Monthly podcast. Um, and I was fortunate enough, my very first Kind of Thrones panel ever was last year's Theon panel, and it was such a blast. So I was so excited to come back this year and talk about the end of his story. So I'm really looking forward to it. Hi, I'm Petra Halber. I write for Watchers on the Wall, and Theon Greyjoy is my favorite character. (laughs) I'm Elizabeth Stevens, and I do several podcasts. Um, Fathom's Deep is what got me here because I watched Black Sails first, and that got me into Game of Thrones. So it's funny, just in doing our introductions, we've already mentioned how interesting his character's arc was. If we could first talk about, you know, now that speculation for the show is at an end and we can step back and look at his arc in its entirety, what do we think his arc was fundamentally about? Like thematically, Mm. what Mm. was at the heart of his story? Uh, yeah, I'll start, I suppose. Um, I really think the biggest thing, and I haven't found a really succinct way to, to articulate this, so I hope you can follow with me just a little bit. I think what we got from the very beginning when we meet, and he's just a dick when we first meet Theon, right? Like, you can't like him. You can't even sympathize with him that much. But as soon as he stops trying to, like, reach out and grasp some sort of identity, as soon as he just accepts who he is, and accepts that who he is is not a leader and is not somebody that I- I- that is like the people he has wanted to be, I suppose, then he comes into himself. Like, once he can be both Stark and Greyjoy, and mm-hmm. once he can be not for me, for Yara, he is Theon. For me, I think his arc is fundamentally the transformation of a selfish person into a selfless mm-hmm. person. Um, There's a lot about identity in his story, Mm -hmm. for sure, and I find that tremendously moving. But in terms of his decision-making, the 
the real shift is when he stops doing everything for himself and he starts serving others. Yeah, I think it, uh, I know at least with Jamie, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth about like, oh, is it a redemption arc? Is it not redemption? And I don't think it's necessarily redemption with Theon either, but it's like self-actualization is his story. Like mm. it's when, it, when he finally like comes to peace with who he is, like, like both of you were saying, um, that that's where like he's supposed to be going is just who he is, not um, redeeming himself, because I don't know, well, we can talk about that, about whether or not it's even possible to re- redeem yourself for the things he did, but rather just, like, being sort of who he's meant to be in a um, very personal sense, not in, like, a, oh, I was born to be the heir to Balon Greyjoy sense. I think the key word is identity, for sure. Um, we have a really interesting lens into his POV, and he suffers from PTSD, and that's something that's, you know, we, we see so many characters suffering, but Theon also goes through, through post-traumatic growth. And I think that's, oh. as Pedro said, when we ha- we're talking about the archetypal structure of the hero's journey, it's kind of the reverse for Theon. He was a dick in the beginning. That the rede- he's the redeemed hero. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, hmm. so that's kind of, I, I think it's about identity for Theon and ultimately um, love as well. For me, uh, one of the things that I really glammed on into George's stories and the the show is the statement of cripples, bastards, and broken things. And to me, Theon is all of those things. Uh, he's, he is the poster child for what George is all about. And he says, I have a soft spot for that. I feel like his journey is the most human journey of, of a lot of the journeys that we have in this story. So uh, that's what it is for me. And the idea of a redemption arc does get touted about with Theon, but very contentiously. Um, what... And really, the topic of redemption could be a panel unto itself. Um, Maybe it is. I'm not actually sure. (laughs) But um, what do we think about Theon's redemption arc? What should it have been? What is redemption? Um, I think, you know, our answer can be kind of tailored to ourselves. Um, But how do we feel with that term being applied to Theon? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think what moves me most about Theon is that I don't think he would ever say that he had been redeemed. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think that he found peace with himself and with his actions. Um, I think that, you know, like, like John could forgive him for what he could forgive. And I think that he was able to find forgiveness from other people. Um, but the redemption, say, from Sansa, Sansa wrapping her arms around him when he comes back to Winterfell, uh, he has so many of those moments where he is redeemed with these relationships in his life and with Yara, of course, who punches them out first and then gives them a hug, you know. Um, but I don't think even maybe, maybe that last moment, you're a good man. He, m- I think he wants to believe it. I don't know if he ever does. Yeah, for me, redemption was never really the core of Theon's story. It uh, Understandably, he did bad things and then he tried to atone for them. Um, but fundamentally, I never felt like what he was after was trying to undo the bad things he did because he knew Mm -hmm. that he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that's a tricky Mm -hmm. thing if your, your bad deeds involve killing people. You cannot make amends. Um, and I like that the show really confronts that with Theon saying, yeah, I can't be forgiven for what I've done. You, you, you can't find closure when you can't apologize to everyone you hurt. So for, for me, I find it a bit... Um, I see his redemption arc as being more of an inverted uh, parallel of the first half of his story. Because Okay, so in my, in my article, I mentioned the... <laughs> I think it's pronounced chiastic structure. Yep, I, I don't right know here. if that's how it's <laughs> pronounced. Yeah. Sorry, people who actually I know. have a definition for a chiastic structure, by the way. Oh, the official one? The official one. Okay. Uh, Characterized by chiasmus, having or uh, denoting a structure in which words are repeated in reverse order. A chiastic structure commonly found in Greek literature or Greek tragedies in poetry. All right. So maybe my concept, (laughs) it's less a repetition of words, although Lord knows we have that plenty with Theon. Yeah. But but it's more for me, it's that the second half of his arc is a mirror of the first, in that first he was selfish, and he wanted to take, and in the second half he wanted to give. Mm. 
and that's less about redemption to me and more about um, becoming, figuring out who he is and becoming selfless where he had been selfish. So you're a good man, Theon, mm -hmm. was a culmination because he was trying to figure out how to be the right kind of person. And that's a little bit different than making it your life's journey to make amends for the bad things that you've de done. I think it's a fine distinction, but I think it's an important one. No, I, uh, I, th I think that's a really good point. And something that, that made me think of is his line, I think, to Maester Lewin in the end of season two, when Lewin's trying to give him all these ways out, right? And Theon's like, no, I've, gone, I've come too far to be anything else. Or, uh, something like that, right? Yeah. And it almost seems like, you know, in, in that moment, he's gone too far as this monstrous person to be anything other than that. And in his final scenes in the show, he's gone too far as, like, a good person to be anything other than a good person, hmm. if you know what I mean. Like, you could almost see him saying that again because now he, he, is, he keeps giving of himself to the Starks and keeps trying to protect them to make up for what he's done. And in the end, he literally can't do anything other than, like, charge at the Night King who's coming at Bran because that he's come too far to do anything other than, like, give of himself. But I think it is more... Um, I'm not going to hog the mic the whole time, I promise. <laughs> but I think it is more than just making up to the Starks because I think a really mm. important beat for him is that he saves Yara because there's yes. this yeah. dual aspect of his yeah. identity yeah. that is yes. important to his story. And so he was never accepted as a Greyjoy or a Stark. And in the end, he, he has to rescue his Greyjoy family and she validates his Greyjoy identity. Well, I, I like that... Yeah. Damn it. No, no, no. I'm keeping this concise. <laughs> he, his, his Greyjoy family needs him, so he helps her, and she validates his Greyjoy identity by saying, what is dead may never die. And then he says, all right, I'm a Greyjoy, but I'm also a Stark, and my Stark family needs me now. Mm -hmm. So he goes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his Stark family um, validates his identity as a Stark with Sansa putting the pin on his sigil. So it's... Um, it's not just about making it up to the Starks. It's also the Greyjoy yeah. half of his identity is also really important. I, I honestly think it's about the power of choice. Because if you look at the conversation between John and Theon, it's like, what are you waiting for? Go do this for yourself. And I think we see that, and, and Martin does this so masterfully with all the POVs in the books. One of my favorite ones is the, the Ghost of Winterfell chapter. But I, I think if you look at Theon's arc, it's like, did, did he ever really feel like he was fully, truly in control of his life? I mean... He wasn't with his real family, and that's, if we put ourselves in his shoes, how would we feel? So I think it ultimately comes down to the power of choice th for Theon, and uh, in the end, I think he realized that he had to make a sacrifice to achieve the power of choice, essentially, hmm. for his life. Yeah, right. yeah, I also agree that both of those families have to be served for him to have any kind of journey towards what one might distinguish as redemption. Um, I love that you guys have brought up the whole thing about Jon Snow because w as a musician and as somebody who looks at the music, the only time that the what is dead may ever die music was transformed from a minor sounding piece, which is usually sad or whatever, uh, to a major sounding piece, which is happier or hopeful, is right after he shouts for Yara and, and they're, all, they're all coming to him, uh, you know, and, and joining in on the, on the fun and so uh, and getting ready to go save her. So I, I felt like that was the moment for me for Theon's journey in the television show where that's the maximum place where Theon can be. And then in order to fulfill it on both sides, then he had to do what he did in season eight. Yeah, I sort of see his character arc as ultimately culminating at the end of season seven. All yeah. of the stuff in season eight for me is, is frosting, but for y not for me, for Yara was... Theon self-actualizing. I totally agree. I remember thinking when I watched that scene that he was taking such a stark action in such a gray joy way. <laughs> and it was just really beautiful. He had just had that conversation with John that you can be both. And then he says, okay, I'm going to go and get my sister back. And how I'm going to do it is by, you know, charging down to the speech and slaughtering a guy because that's the other side of me, you know. It was well, but cool. also the way he does it is by, like, technically he rises again, but not necessarily harder and stronger, but bloodier and a little, like, woozier every <laughs> time, mm. yeah. which is mm -hmm. a distinctly Theon thing. Like, Theon never <laughs> looks cool when he does anything. That's <laughs> yeah. very that's good. true. And I, that's a yes. large part of why I love him. Yep. But he, he gets the job done, but 
in the least romantic looking way <laughs> imaginable. Well, and I think that's interesting too. Like, we, the audience, kind of know that Theon, as much as we love him, is like a, like he's not one of the big five or six characters. You know, he's not like Bran, Danny, Tyrion, John, Sansa. Like, he's not in that upper echelon. He's like one removed from that. And so I feel like his story is almost about him realizing that. Being like, yes. oh, <laughs> yes. I'm not a main character. I'm here to support the main yeah. characters. Yes. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe that's too meta, but... Uh, I, lo- I love when you say meta, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel... Actually, I, I just look at the way that I felt about Theon also in terms of his arc. Because in the first season, it's like, guy's kind of a jerk. And then in the second season, it's like, I can't believe you just did that. And in the third season, which you don't really don't get until you get into the fifth book, right? But mm-hmm. in the third season, uh, it was just kind of like, okay, you're paying for it. Good. Mm-hmm. I honestly felt that way. Wow. Yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help it. Until it got to, you know, like the seventh or eighth time we seen being tortured. Yeah. And then I was kind of like, okay, he's had enough. <laughs> and, and then the fourth season, it's like, where are you? You're not even here anymore because Ramsey had droned everything, you know, just drummed everything out of him. And then the fifth season, he finally starts to come back around. Sansa helps him remember who he is again. Uh, the sixth season is the beginning of him making up for everything. So, The one thing that's interesting, too, is we see, le- like, we saw a lot more of what happens to Dion in the show than in the books. Like, Dion kind of disappears for a while. So, um, and, and, of course, Alfie Allen, cred to Alfie for just emoting everything oh, so excellently. So yeah, Theon! <laughs> <That's a, laughs> Patriot's like, oh my god, I love Alfie. Um, no, no, that's my imitation of him, of him getting torched. Oh, okay. That was the, uh, the oh, I, thought, I thought you were like no, rocking No, no god Theon. no, you were, you were saying like Alfie's performance in season three, and oh, I was yeah. like, yeah, when he's just hanging oh, and yeah. going, ah! <laughs> for an entire season. Didn't he kiss yeah. your hand? He did, yeah. Wow, I'm jealous. <laughs> that's okay. It was a good moment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's that's a question I wanted to ask you guys though. Um, is like experiencing Theon's uh, torture. You, I mean, you were saying you you watch that and you're like, okay, yeah, he had that coming, but maybe not that. Um, at what point do you s- did you stop feeling like he deserved it and start feeling like he deserved sympathy, or did you ever reach that point? Like, I know a lot of people really vary, and because mm-hmm. I think there are still some people who are like, yeah, no, Theon. You know, should be dead. Like they should have kept torturing him, right. which I would disagree with. But like, I think it's something that people land very differently on. Um. Oh, this is a tricky one. I yeah. don't like that kind of punishment in general. Uh-huh. So especially since he was already so tortured within himself. Like it'd be one thing if he ha- if he was like Cersei, never looked back. But he was never that way. He always was conflicted about what he had done. He always had a lot of guilt. And so it was um, in some ways almost self-fulfilling like that. I feel like he de- he deserved to be Reek, which is why he a- accepted that title and that role, I think, as quickly as he did and why he was broken so quickly. Um, so I, I suppose my shorter answer is that it wasn't long at all for me. It was just a few seconds. I was like, okay, I, I want you to... I- I just want to add this. If I had to ask you a question of what do you think is worse, not being accepted by your father or loved by your family or being tortured, I think that would be ultimately like I felt like that was worse torture, him not feeling love in his life. And, you know, when we're seeing teach Theon get tortured, it's like, okay, like we're, absor- we're, we're seeing Theon get tortured, but for him it's like that's not even that bad. But see, he wants to be loved so badly, right? Yeah. It's like you were saying, like it's that validation for him, yeah. like, oh yeah, I am a bad person. I deserve mm-hmm. this. Like, yeah. Of course, no one would love me. <laughs> yeah. So I almost think like deeply the, the, lo- the love that he's yearning for is that that's the worst torture for him. I don't know. That's kind of mm-hmm. I mean mm-hmm. how I see it. Interesting. It's interesting. The, the first time I watched season three, I was confused because I was trying to go book to season, and I was hoping it was a one to one comparison. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I thought Theon was dead. Sure. So when he showed up, I was confused right. mm-hmm. the entire time. So I didn't even have time to like take into account his arc. Um, however, going back, I I do enjoy, I really like watching reaction videos and mm-hmm. watching people gradually change their opinion of his torture because it is mm-hmm. a really interesting thing 
to get an audience to want to watch a character suffer and then to give them exactly what they want until they don't want it anymore. Mm. It's it's very much like um, Joffrey's death in that way. Like, Joffrey's death is kind of the microcosm of that where, like, by the end you're like, oh, wow, that's just, like, he should be dead. Like, he's really suffering. That's awful. Right. Even though he's Joffrey. I mean, yeah. you know, but so... I, I yeah, kind of and, and, and all maybe and all, I'm alone you know. in feeling sympathy <laughs> for Joffrey in his final moments. And also <laughs> Theon witnessing what happened to Sansa, like Ramsay making him stand there, like mm. that, like his. That's also t- that's psychological. Like yeah. Theon oh, right. suffers yeah. from very serious PTSD. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, yeah, that's and, and hence the relapse that we had in season seven. Exactly. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think. Um, C- certainly, Sansa's wedding night was worse for her yeah. than oh, yeah. for oh, absolutely. Theon. Absolutely, I'm not. By the way, I agree with Petra. Just saying, <laughs> <laughs> so don't kill me. Whenever Sansa's wedding night comes up, I'm just like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for saving me. Change this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I, I like that his his motivation for s- sort of uh, for killing Miranda, for him finally overcoming Reek, is when Miranda threatens to do to Sansa what Ramsay did to him. Yep. Mm. Because yep. specifically, what he what he tells Sansa is, um, "Do what he says, or else he'll hurt you." Which mm. sounds really insensitive, provided the situation that she's in. But what he means is, he will limit himself to beating and raping you. He won't flay you or mutilate you. Which, mm. in his mind, is worse. We don't have to agree with that, but that is his his standpoint. Mm. And then Miranda says, oh, no, our plan has always been to flay and mutilate you once you've given him a son or two. And you can see the little, like, shattered light bulb above Theon's head oh. start to kind of flicker back on mm. when that happens. And that's what finally gets him to change his mind. He realizes, oh, I can't actually protect her. I thought I was, mm-hmm. and I can't. Mm-hmm. 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 That that his Good way point. of protecting by like retreating and encouraging her to like just retreat in, in mm-hmm. herself and like hide yeah. from it that that wouldn't work anymore. You can't escape Ramsay, so avoid pain. Right. Mm-hmm. And it turns out she can't avoid pain, and that's mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. the situation changes. You know, there's something interesting um, about that scene too, because it it almost kind of calls back to when Sansa is standing with Joffrey on the battlements, looking at Ned's head. Right, and mm-hmm. she's she's like walking to push him off, and then the hound stops her, and it's like, no, just you know, like that's right. Yeah, conceal, don't feel, oh, and like, oh. um, <laughs> whoa, and, oh, blowing my mind. You know, but but th- this comparison between like Theon and Sandor as mm-hmm. protectors for Sansa, and it's almost like this scene is an answer to that one, where Theon oh, as the protector like is like, no, wait a second, I can just I can end this right now and just push that person, and then we're done. Like mm-hmm. instead of prolonging it and just trying to. It, it's it's interesting that you say that because in the hero's journey, because in the hero's journey, there's mentors for each character. Yeah, and it's like, mm-hmm. who do we think of that for Theon? Like, what would what would you say? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't think Theon has a mentor. I think yeah. that's a large part of his problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's, right. that's why his yeah. arc is so interesting. The I think the ghost of Ned. Yeah. 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 Okay. This whole oh. Ned <laughs> was oh Theon's boy. real father really pisses Ooh. me off. Ooh. Mm. I, Ned did his best, but at the end of the day, he was still raising a child that he knew he might have to kill one day, which is not explicitly stated in the show, which is why I think a lot of show only viewers mm. or show only fans mm. um, hate Theon more, or they mm. say that he was ungrateful to the Starks for loving him. And mm. I'm like, n- no, Ned would have had to cut off Theon's head had Balon rebelled again. Right. You don't grow up with a person. As you're, w- when your father figure might have to kill you one day, you are not set up for a healthy adulthood. It's very uh, Dread Pirate Roberts. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> Good night, Theon. Might have to kill you in the morning. Exactly, <laughs> like, yes. At, at, wow. at the same time, one of the more <laughs> effective... <laughs> Michael Slow Clap. <laughs> Dread, <laughs> Dread Pirate Theon. At, at the same time, I think one of the more effective means of torture of Theon was that, those opening things. Not where Ramsay was having mm-hmm. physical pain given to him, but mm-hmm. letting him think that he escaped, letting him bring him back, oh, trying yeah. to draw yeah. those things out of him. Yeah. Uh, I think as TV show only people, because I hadn't read the fifth book by that time yet either. I, I didn't read the f- fifth book until between seasons four and five. Anyway, uh, I was under the impression that, oh, this is, this is good. Maybe Theon can come back because of this thought. 
tell like a little oh, funny anecdote, or it's not an anecdote, it's just a, an opinion that I had once. <laughs> That's, That's, not not That's not an anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> By definition. Hot take income. Yeah, okay. We'll take um, it. <laughs> so um, I knew, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a Iwan Rayon hipster, in that I knew him from Spring Awakening, in which he played Mort Stiefel, who was like the sad, kicked puppy who commits suicide. Mm. Um, and then Misfits, in which he played like the sad, kicked puppy who can turn invisible. So he was like a uh, typecast as the sweet, big eyed puppy boy. So when he showed up as the nice, ironborn stable boy, I was like, oh, of course, Rayon would be playing the guy who's helping Theon because that's mm. his typecast. And, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> ah! <laughs> Oh, no. So, um, so, so that was That's really, amazing. really effective casting, casting. Yeah. to subvert expectations. Absolutely. And to Paige's delight, <laughs> he then, did much more. Yeah. <laughs> then things got weird. <laughs> so. Anybody? Anybody? Shall we continue? Do you have a specific point that we want to start off? Oh, I was going to, I mean, if, if we're... Looking, if we're going to change topics, I was going to bring book Theon into the conversation, mm -hmm. unless yeah, exclusively show discussion still has some some points to be made. No, no, no. Book Theon. I'm happy to roll. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going with that. Because I think there are a lot of interesting contrasts between book Theon and show Theon, not just in terms of the fact that they are in totally different situations, but um, in terms of the characterization. And so, how do we how do we feel about the differences in uh, between Theon in the books versus in the show? Well, I personally find uh, each of them being really compelling for the medium that they're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, simply because I, I feel like book Theon, there's, um, George obviously has more time to develop it and, and more space within to development. Um, in TV show, you obviously don't have that kind of luxury, so you depend on Alfie to really drive it home in a visual way, so uh, th just on kind of a surface level, that's that's where I find that the thing is. It's like I can read Theon and feel what he's what he's going through there on a like you said on a different level, but it seems much more appropriate for that medium than it would have come across in a television show. I think for each POV, like Martin loves to have like like is it, like each POV has this different vehicle, like this kind of lesson he's trying to teach us mm. with each different POV. And I, I'm like, I, I'm bringing up PTSD again. It's like, there's so many characters that are suffering through these terrible things in Westeros, but I'm not, I don't want to say Theon is suffering more than anyone else, but I, I just, I think George R. R. Martin is kind of trying to give us a lens into that. And that's, that, and that's what I find so interesting about the Theon chapters, because we get kind of some of those fight club vibes. And uh, that's, I mean, especially in the Ghost of Winterfell chapter, which is one of my top five favorite chapters, you're kind of like, and it's it's almost like I don't want to say horror esque, but it's definitely got this yeah. creepy feel to it, oh, yeah. and especially um, like I don't want to. Uh, well, Euron has very much that kind of like HP Lovecraft vibe, but for Theon, it feels like it, it's it's so crazy how uh, Martin jerks us back and forth, right? Like um, between Reek and Theon towards the end of Dance of Dragons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the differences between book and show Theon are. I think mostly with the presentation, there's a few like big, uh, a, a few larger differences, I guess. But um, one that has always jumped out at me is that in the books, Theon does have kind of a relationship with his uncle um, Aaron. Uh, in book two, Aaron comes with him and helps him raid the North and mm -hmm. is like encouraging him to be this this Ironborn person. Um, whereas you don't have that in the show as much. It's really just like the kind of Dagmar Cleftjaw guy helping him out but um, I, I think it's an interesting note that kind of Ironborn religion that was, wasn't as present in the show um, but mm. Theon's relationship to like being a drowned man um, like his uncle Aaron and this having this fundamentalist uncle like pushing him to kill the tall heart squires or whatever it is he does mm -hmm. in book two. And um, also Theon's not at the king's moot either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, in terms of the plot. Yeah, um, so. yeah which I mean, <laughs> well, I'm just gonna say I fi I I have a lot less sympathy for Theon in the books, and I hmm. find his wow. arc less <laughs> compelling in the books than I do in the show. He's he's much he is wow. a rapist. He's much worse in the 
books and yet he's less sorry for it afterwards mm-hmm. which mm. i i find very interesting and so i've really appreciated in the show that they they shifted that and they really spent some time meditating on theon's regret yeah. and, and the fact that he says i can't be forgiven I'm so glad they did, too, because I don't think we get another character that really does that in the same way, at least. I don't think we ever get anyone who grieves as much for mistakes that they've made. Um, Daenerys can't stop to grieve for mistakes. She just has to learn from them and move on until she stops learning. Cersei just doesn't give a shit. She just is <laughs> very happy to burn it all to the ground and sip her wine. And uh, sh- I think that in Theon, seeing him make these decisions and then just be so torn up about it, gives us a just a, a very different character to watch and makes, to me, it fletches out Westeros much more. Like, it makes it full of more human people rather than such archetypal people. Like, it's nice to have something that someone who's neither villain nor hero, but who I'm so invested in, I suppose, watching them strive and make these mistakes and learn and, and grieve. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting, too. You were mentioning, like, the idea of the point of view on... Westerosi suffering and using Theon as like a lens for that and then what you were just saying um, it's almost like Theon is like the the whipping boy for everyone who's ever hurt the Starks like mm-hmm. we don't see we don't get Walder Frey's point of view as he's fed his sons in the show or you know whatever um, oh no wait Arya just kills him I can't remember the way she killed all the people but that Theon is like our window into what people should be <laughs> feeling about um, having wronged the Starks yeah. Um, whether that's Walder or Roos or whoever, that Theon is the one that all of that suffering and like angst and not redemptive qualities, but just mm-hmm. like uh, the weight of the sins against the Starks is kind of all heaped on Theon, or at least that's our point of view, like th- mm-hmm. that he's the point of view through which we see. Um, I don't know, yeah, the, the weight of the sins uh, against the Stark family. I guess I want to ask all of you guys, do you feel like the archetype of Theon in the books in the sh- is, like, is very different in the book and the show? Do you feel like, because obviously we, we don't have Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring, so. so oh. Any day now. Um, I'm knocking on wood for everyone, but I hope this, is this wood? I don't know. Uh, we hope we get it soon. So, like, because we, we, we do have You're a Good Man, Theon, so that in some people's eyes that might be as seen as redemption, like, and he gets, seen you know, at the Stark pin from Sansa. And in the books, it's like, you think, I mean, he's in a much more precarious position. Like, is he going to get sacrificed to that weirwood tree? Like, what's going to... So I I think it's really interesting. Like, are they the same archetype? I don't think so. I I have to brew on this for a second before I can actually (laughs) speak in full sentences. Yeah, right. (laughs) All right. Well, I agree. I I don't think so. I I think that if you're looking at the archetype for Theon in the books, um, I don't think you're going to get something nearly as extreme of a, like you put earlier, a reverse mirror. I don't think we're going to get that in the books. I, I think that, that Theon's archetype in the books is now much more victim. Maybe survivor, but I, I still feel like he's much more of a of, of victim, whereas Theon in the show had a chance to come back over more circumstances. I know this is going to sound weird, but I feel like Tyrion and Theon in the books and Tyrion and Theon in the show, like, a reverse. Tyrion seemed more heroic in the show, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I feel like in the books, like, see you, you, you yeah. see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I kind of feel like that. Huh. It's, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think Theon is cooler in the books. <laughs> like, he's got more of a, well, no, but like, for example, when he uh, is a ward of the Starks, both of them have a lot of sex to compensate for what they're lacking, but Theon in the books has sex with married women. So he's the archetypal, like, he would be the guy who's, like, climbing out of the window when he hears yeah. the husband's horse come <laughs> into the driveway, <laughs> yeah, and right. he's like, all right, sorry. Like, he's that guy. <laughs> Whereas Theon in the show can only have sex with sex workers because no one else wants to fuck him. Well, that's a not. very different kind of problem. That's a that's a good point. He's more of like a sad sack in the show, whereas in the yes. books he's he's like like oh. hair slicked back kind of. He's more of a bad boy. Black black he's yeah. actually more he's of a bad boy. He's, got, he's a bit no. more of a bad boy. <laughs> and I was I was looking at one of the the graphic novel adaptations, and it's oh. hilarious how much the drawing of Theon looks like Loki from the Avengers. <laughs> he's got the oh, thin wow. face. And yeah. the long black hair and the smile that never looks good and, like, yeah. the, the black 
and he looks so overtly evil that it's hilarious <laughs> anyone ever trusted him. Whereas, like, Alfie Allen looks more... Beautiful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think so. I yeah. think so. <laughs> but, but, well, but in the books, he looks like, I mean, he's like, looks like Gollum. <laughs> like oh, after. Well, yeah. We're talking about Reek. I was talking oh, about Pre. Like he's okay. he's described as being handsome. So mm-hmm. there's this kind of like dangerous bad boy, uh, ladies man oh. element yeah. that he has in the books that is absolutely not there in the show. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> now I can't. I mean, I can't yeah. like see that now. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Gallivant- yeah. Gallivanting. It's it's that self confidence, yeah. It's swagger, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, <laughs> which you know I think you could argue in the books he had more of a connection to his uncles. Like he mm-hmm. probably saw a cool uncle Euron at like a you know barbecue or something, and was like, shit, I want to be that. Like in the way like a tiny kid would. Not, yeah. not in the way like <laughs> he's pretty young. So. <laughs> Also, like the merging of characters in the show too, like they like plot line. That that's also something that happened because of how uh, how much time they had left in the show. So I think that depending on what happens in the Winds of Winter, if Theon doesn't get executed early, um, it'll be really interesting to kind of see how that goes because you know each POV character has very very specific uh, things that are happening in their storyline. So because they kind of gave Theon some some different stuff that I thought you know were merged with other characters in the show. I mean, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm so tempted to talk about the the sample chapter in the Winds of Winter, but I know that's that's spoilery and off limits. <laughs> I, I, okay, wait, wait. Is anyone here? Does anyone here? Raise your hand if you don't want us to talk about the sample chapter from. Oh, okay. No, it is oh, that's one. It only one takes one. one. That's one. We <laughs> shall not discuss it. We shall limit ourselves ears. to the published books. Yep, Thank you for awesome. being honest. No, 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 no. Oh, my no, God. No. No, no, no. no, we've got gigantic books we can talk about. Yeah, we don't have to talk about that little bone. thing. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Huh? Um, oh, do we want to talk about Theon and his sister? Yeah. The contentious right. name? <laughs> Yarasha. <laughs> Yarasha. Yarasha. Yeah. Yarasha. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're touching reunion. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> do you like that? Took I me like a that. second, Thank yeah. I like that. I like how, once mm-hmm. again, they really emphasize the affection between them in the yeah. show more than they do in the books. Um, which, I, 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 to some extent, I'm kind of wondering, I want to know what George's plan is for their relationship in the books because I don't get that sense of... I, I find them much more compelling in the show as siblings than I do in the books, which they're the best like siblings I feel like we get in the show. <laughs> we get yeah. tons and tons of siblings, but I feel like those are the two that relate to each other the most like a, like a brother and sister do in the way that I recognize brother and sister, I suppose. You know <laughs> I, is I mean? it because sure. of Ironborn culture, you think, because it's so masculine? You know what I mean? And the, the, Theon admires his sister. You yeah. think that's maybe why? That's You're awesome. I, I mean, I think that's a that's an opinion I've I've heard throughout the fandom yeah, that people were. That's liberated. interesting. Yeah. yeah, I don't um. think LGBT representation is great in either the books or the show. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely like yeah. that we got to see her flirt with Ilaria and Daenerys, but Very I fun. wouldn't go out on a limb and declare Yara fantastic bisexual representation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, it it is interesting though the way in the show like um, she and. She plays off of Theon, particularly in season six and seven, I guess, um, at, because she is definitely like performing Ironborn masculinity in a yeah. way that he just he, he can't and won't. And there's that scene in I think it's season six when they're traveling 
to Marine, and she's giving him kind of like this tough love speech, mm -hmm. you know, like, <laughs> which is, it's like the worst way to, if you have a friend who's gone through some trauma, don't, yeah. don't, don't do, do what Yara does, <laughs> which is like, get over it, punch. <laughs> but it's also like, mm -hmm. it, it's, I, it, it's her showing affection in this way that yeah. like, she doesn't know another way to show affection to him, but she's really trying. Well, and I love when she, oh yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think he knows this because we get those great scenes where Yara will, rem will, will speak to him about remembering him as a baby yeah. and about how that affection, because that's the longest memory that she carried, I in a sense, she always knew Theon as a small, helpless thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having to adjust to him as being like a grown man and a person with like a will of his own is, an, is a new thing. And so I think he always feels that sense of an almost maternal instinct sometimes from Yara that I think goes a long way. Ooh. Yeah. It's I mean, it's not like Balon said that. So. <laughs> wow. You make a great point about Theon's mother, and we have that with so many different characters, like how mothers and fathers affect their kids, yeah. right? Like love. It's just mm -hmm. Theon doesn't feel that. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this isn't my Theon apologist hat coming on, <laughs> but in all sincerity, the the root at a lot of his toxicity in the first two books and mm -hmm. seasons was that he was overcompensating for a lack of love. Mm -hmm. He was taken from his family under traumatic circumstances to live with a family who might have to execute him one day. Mm -hmm. that's, n that's going to twist you and you're going to find ways of finding that unmet, uh, of satisfying that unmet need for love. And for him it's, you know, toxic, abusive treatment of right. women and sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do like that you know, the, the second half of his arc is him expressing love for other people. He wanted love, so he took it forcibly. Oh, and so he's yeah. now expressing, I love my sister, I'm going to go help her. I love my Stark family, I'm going to go help them. Mm -hmm. So he wanted, and now he gives. Right. I think the thing that uh, Theon and Balon and Mary got from the first book, I think, mm. that was Well, and it's yeah. well, but what he says is you don't have the right. Right uh, yeah. before that, they'd had a conversation where uh, Theon's trying to tell him to go to war, and Rob says it's not your duty because it's not your house. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what he tells Theon after he took the risk to save Bran was it's uh, it. Uh, oh, sorry, I saw the ten minutes left, and I forgot <laughs> what I was saying. <laughs> um, you don't have the right, yeah. which is what he says. Well, I think that's a great moment for Theon too because. He says there, uh, what, it was the only thing to do, so I did it. And it, to him, that, that's again a callback later when he's talking to John about how you always knew the right thing to do. Like to him, in that moment, that was the absolute right thing to do, and he was mm -hmm. immediately slapped down for it. That's so it's just back to doubting that he has good intentions or that he knows what's right. And I like that that scene specifically was evoked again in Stormborn when he, when his sister is oh. being held by their uncle, and then again when he has to defend Bran from the Night King. So mm -hmm. that's such a pivotal mm -hmm. moment in his story that we got, you know, reprises of it twice yes. with different outcomes. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, again, it's it's uh, him recognizing that his role in the story is not protagonist but bodyguard. <laughs> 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 <It's> Interesting. <laughs> Which I think is great. It shows so much. This is my purpose. I'm here to save the main character. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. He's a main character. Make sure. <laughs> he is a side Please character for me. sure. <laughs> I would never I'm do that. <laughs> I think that is, though, a really interesting thing about Theon because, like, we're always told or, or we think about, you know, well, everyone's the hero of their own story. Mm -hmm. But Theon isn't. And I think that's <laughs> really interesting. Like, I can't think of many times that, like, he does not, a or at least after a while, at first he's trying to do that very much. But by the time we get to the end, he ha has, like, set that mantle aside and has taken up something more like some, some of the characters. Like, I suppose Jorah is another example of somebody who mm. is in a position like that that considers themselves even more than Tyrion because I think that Tyrion would have more power if he thought he could get it 
but Jorah wouldn't, I don't think. And I think that that's where Theon was going. Like, had he been able to continue that arc that they were doing, like, he would have been to Yara something, a, 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 a true advisor and a true, like, just somebody very noble to have by your side. I th- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I think it's so interesting in the show, too, like, Sansa is in Winterfell, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's a big thing, too. So it's like, the, uh, like Sansa is in the Vale in the books. So it's like, mm. Theon, I think Theon feels, uh, because it's Sansa, especially in the show, he feels this responsibility, and he's like, I don't know. It's, it's just so different because Sansa is in Winterfell in the show, I think. And, and, that, and that really changes the plot. But yeah. his motivations and his actions yeah. are still fairly equal by a lesser character, uh, you know, by... By the the character that he's with in in the books, uh, is it Jane? Is Jane mm-hmm. Poole? Jane yeah. Poole. Fake Arya. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> sorry. How how are you relating? The well, uh, he's saying he's saying how Sansa affected TV Theon. I feel like that Jane Poole affected book Theon mm-hmm. in much the same way. See, um, this is one of those like really. One of those controversial storylines story where when I kind of like weigh in, I always feel like I'm like, I, I want to be delicate. But at the same time, um, Theon never seemed to care about Jane in the books. I think he was kind of disturbed by the bruises, but he didn't save her because he cared about her. He saved her because uh, the washerwomen were kind of twisting his arm behind his back. Mm. And he just kind of mm. does it. And he doesn't really care about her. And so I really like that as as problematic as that storyline was in season five, that he does it purely because he loves Sansa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's mm-hmm. quite simple in the mm-hmm. show. I, I don't understand why he couldn't have been just a little bit more compassionate in the books. It's truncated, okay. but he gets the power the power of choice again. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, when is he finally going to take that next step in his transformation to becoming Theon Greyjoy again from Reek? Yeah, and it is more of a choice in the show than it is in the books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think that if Yara had not given him leave to go to Winterfell, that he would have gone anyway? I don't think so. No? I, oh. Mm. I, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> See, I'm like really 50-50 <laughs> on that. I, yeah. I really like that she, she, he doesn't even have to ask. She, she right, it which is face. beautiful. She senses it. Yeah, that's a gorgeous moment. That's true. Especially because she so uh, invalidated him in season two saying, would you have our father bow before your real family? And he's saying, I don't have another family. And she says, don't you? And she really despises his love yeah. of the Starks. Mm-hmm. And that in season eight, she acknowledges that he loves the Starks too. Mm-hmm. And that that's okay. He can be a Greyjoy and he can love the Starks. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the fact that he says, you are my queen, I go where you command, I think is important. Yeah. Does he really mean that? I genuinely think he does. He's kind of mm. doing that little I'm about to start crying face that he does a lot. <laughs> 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 well, we you know, have I to be. He's really <laughs> good at it, isn't yeah. he? I, I think we all knew that that was the last time they were going to see each other, right? Oh, mm. yep. uh, I Sorry. Wasn't, but <laughs> I know. Yeah. We've got five minutes left. Maybe we could um, talk about how we wish his story I, our ideal ending for Theon be it in the books oh. or the show like if we Damn. could come up with it ourselves sure. how would his story have ended <laughs> oh am I you just fucking say that I mean you, you know what mine is going to be because we talked about oh, it last say year it again. <laughs> say it again. Um, but my ideal ending for Theon is that he just retires to one of the smallest iron islands and opens up like a little crab shack and for fermented? <laughs> yeah, for, could be fermented. He could do yeah. fermented on like fermented special menu crabs. and then like, you know, have a backup. Gotta put a hole through your um, chain mail. <laughs> but, you know, just like to retire to a life mm-hmm. of quiet anonymity wow. um, and like hang out on a beach by himself. I was. Uh, yeah. Hey, that, and see, there's like some potent symbolism so, here with the fermented nice. crab. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there's a character named Torgon the Latecomer, and I, I was hoping that Theon would become like this, the second coming of that character, and he would, you know. The one that survive is one of the crippled bastards and broken things, um, but yeah, that was kind of where I wanted it to go. I, 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 you know, I always felt sympathetic from Theon from the beginning because you know I've had friends who, you know, uh, have in, in families who have had really tough divorces and stuff like that, and not having really good uh, familial figures to like you know guide them. And I just always felt sympathy for Theon and I, I, I hoped that he would find peace and happiness in the end. But it's a song of ice and fire, Game of Thrones. So, <laughs> <laughs> as far as season eight goes, for me, um, I don't know if I can comment on the books, but as far as season eight goes, 
more. We could have had a lot more than what we got, uh, more than just like five minutes here and five minutes there. Uh, but I think his ultimate end, if he didn't have to sacrifice himself for Bran, uh, would have been really good as Sansa's hand. This is what I'm thinking, something like a hand for, for, for both of his sisters, I think. This idea of someone who goes back and forth between those two worlds, then he becomes the bridge between Winterfell and the Iron Islands for keeps in a way that was not the intention when he was taken from uh, from the Iron Islands. But now it, it, that would become sort of, it would necessitate peace, I think, in a way that's really interesting. Wow, oh, I yeah. like that. See, I always, I thought of him as being hand for Yara specifically. Oh, yeah. And something that I had liked was um, the prospect of them having to, because in, in old Iron Island history, they used to have a, a rock king and a salt king, and they were usually siblings, and they co-ruled. Gorgeous. And so, and this, this oh. might have been mm. problematic, but if Yara had not emerged from captivity under Euron unscathed, if she had, I thought he might have cut out her tongue, oh. which would have been all kinds of problematic in the mutilation of an LGBT woman. I acknowledge that. But as far as sheer symbolism goes, that she comes out of it changed the way he emerged from captivity changed. Mm -hmm. And so they have to work together to rule the Iron Islands as the Salt King and the Rock Queen. So neither wow. of them are complete unto themselves, but they complete each other. They work together. They rule the Iron so, Islands. So Theon could like speak for her and she would continue the Greyjoy line, like kind of that. Like in that way as well. Yeah, like she she would ha she would make the decisions because she's better at making decisions than he is. <laughs> yeah, but he would, would really communicate. Yeah. He would speak yeah. for her. Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> Petra, Petra. Petra. Very good. <laughs> um, are we finished? I think we, we, had, like we had two, two minutes, minutes left. Minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Yeah, I mean, I I do like the idea of him as sort of a bridge between the Iron Islands and the North. Um, to, really to, to turn like the really toxic hostage relationship that he found himself in yeah. into something that's like positive and like a vehicle for like yeah. uniting people and peace instead of like oh my dad might kill me especially <laughs> the Ironborn yeah. culture which is so violent yeah, yeah for sure I think mm -hmm. that would also part of it would help solve the problem of like why is Yara taken to like the Six Kingdoms or whatever mm. like And we saw that she was willing to give up the, uh, when, when she said to Daenerys, that's our way of life. Not anymore. She was willing to do that already. So, yeah. <laughs> or the North becomes more badass, like either way. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone for showing up. This is a round of applause. Thank you. Say Podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag Can I Just Say and follow us on Twitter at Just Say Podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.